people who are about to sign an important paper are often asked to put your John Hancock here. That's because the first person to sign the Declaration of Independence inspired this expression. John Hancock. John Hancock. John Hancock. John Hancock was born January 12, 1737, in Quincy, Massachusetts, to a family of clergymen or ministers who were known for their great love and devotion to the people that they served. When he was about the age of seven years old, young John Hancock's father died. But he was luckily adopted by an uncle, Thomas Hancock who happened to be the richest merchant in Boston and the most enterprising in all of New England. With the help of this uncle, John Hancock received an excellent education and he graduated from Harvard College in 1754. After college, John was a clerk in the counting house of his uncle and later, while he was on a trip to London to observe the English side of the business, he attended the funeral of King George II and the coronation of King George III, who apparently granted him an audience. Shortly after his return to America, his uncle died, leaving John, who was about 27 years old, his very large business and his princely fortune, which was at the time the largest estate in the Providence. John Hancock continued his life in moderation because many depended upon him as they had depended on his uncle for employment. As a boss and as a provider, he was kind and he was generous. He maintained a high reputation for regularity, industry, honor, and integrity. He didn't allow his inheritance to corrupt his honorable and his respectable reputation. And in fact, actually used it to compound his good standing with those that were around him, which naturally gave him influence in his community and made him very popular. Hancock affiliated with other merchants in protesting the Stamp Act of 1765, and having found that passion about politics, began a long political career the following year. In 1766, he was placed in the legislature of Massachusetts, and this event seems to have given a direction to the future career of his life. This meant that he became associated with men of great political distinction, acute determination, and patriotic feeling. In such an atmosphere, the genius of John Hancock was quickly realized. It was during this time that soldiers and the citizens would often fight. These fights soon broke out into acts of violence. Well, a very sad experience happened on the evening of the 5th of March of 1770. A small party of British soldiers were attacked with balls of snow and other weapons. The soldiers fired upon them by order of their commanding officer, and a few were actually killed, and others were severely wounded. From a snowball? Well, Although the citizens did start at this time, the whole of the town wanted satisfactions for the wrongs that had been done. Samuel Adams and Mr. John Hancock asked for an assembly of citizens to meet the following day, and they formed a committee to demand the governor to remove his troops. Of this committee, John Hancock was the chairman. This sad experience is actually termed the Boston Massacre. The bodies of the slain were buried with a large amount of public grief. Mr. Hancock was asked to give an address. How dare you tread on the earth which has now drunk the blood of the slaughtered innocent shed by your hands? How dare you breathe the air which wafted to the ear of heaven the groans of those who fell as sacrifice to accursed ambition? And you must lift your hands, now red with the blood of those whose death you have procured or caused. At the tremendous bar of God, let this sad tale of death never be told without a tear. 
can you believe that previous to this address, there were actually doubts by some people as to the perfect patriotism of Mr. Hancock? Not after that speech. It was said that the governor of the province had endeavored to attach Mr. Hancock to the royal cause. His fortune was princely. His mansion displayed the magnificence of a courtier rather than the simplicity of a mere Republican. Gold and silver embroidery adorned his garments, and on public occasions, his carriage and his horses and his servants in the livery emulated the splendor of the English nobility. Mr. Hancock, from this time, became an enemy to the royal governor and of his people. As Mr. Hancock was very close to the Republican Party, it now became, he now became, an object of some importance to the royal governor to get possession of Mr. Hancock and of Samuel Adams. And this led to the expedition to Concord, which led to the Battle of Lexington, which opened the Revolutionary War. When the first Provincial Congress met in 1774, John Hancock was unanimously elected as its president, as well as the chairman of the Vital Council of Safety. When the second Provincial Congress met in 1775, they elected him to the presidency of the Continental Congress. In this body were men of superior genius to him, such as Franklin, Jefferson, Dickinson, and many, many others. But the proclamation of Governor Gage wanting Hancock and Adams had given these two men great popularity and, then, and gave enough reason for the Continental Congress to express their respect for them in electing John Hancock to the presidential chair of that Congress. On April 18th, only three days after the Provincial Congress adjourned, British troops marched into Boston to seize rebel stores at Concord, having been warned of their approach during the night by Paul Revere. John Hancock and Samuel Adams fortunately made their escape, but it was only at the moment that the British troops entered into the house where they were lodged. These two men avoided Boston and hid in various places for two weeks before proceeding on into Philadelphia. Following this, Governor Gage issued his proclamation, offering a general pardon to those who should give proper penitence for their opposition to the royal authority, except the above two gentlemen, whose guilt had placed them beyond the reach of the royal mercy. John Hancocks and Samuel Adams were the two most wanted men in the colonies by King George III. John Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776, at the age of 39, firmly cementing his standing in opposition to the British during the American Revolution. Charles Goodrich writes of John Hancock's signing, A signature to the Declaration of Independence without reference to general views was, to each individual, a personal consideration of the most momentous import. It would be regarded in England as treason and exposed any man to the halter or the block. In this work of treason, John Hancock led the way. As president of the Congress, and by the force with which he wrote, he seemed to have determined that his name should never be erased. Hancock held the distinguished position of president of the Continental Congress until October of 1777, at which time, due to his ill health, he resigned his office and retired until 1788, when he chaired the Massachusetts Convention that ratified the U.S. Constitution. After an interval of two years, he was re-elected to the same office and was also governor from 1780 to 1785 and 1787 to 1793. On October 8, 1793, Mr. Hancock died in Boston at the age of 56. His funeral was one of the most impressive ever held in New England. It culminated 
in burial at Old Granary Burying Ground. His character and habits of Mr. John Hancock throughout his life were always on the side of virtue. He was kind and he was courteous. He claimed no superiority from his advantage and manifested no arrogance on behalf of his wealth. Many examples of his generosity of character are recorded. It is said that in times of distress, hundreds of families were daily fed from his kindness. No one spent more wealth or will ever spend a greater sacrifice promoting the liberties of his country. Charles Augustus Goodrich writes of Mr. Hancock, to a young man, only 27, this sudden possession of wealth was full of danger and to not a few would have proved their ruin. But Mr. Hancock became neither giddy nor arrogant nor profligate. He continued his former course of regularity, industry, and moderation. Many depended upon him as they had done upon his uncle for employment. To these he was kind and liberal, while in his more extended and complicated commercial transactions, he maintained a high reputation for honor and integrity. The possession of wealth added to the upright and honorable character which he sustained, naturally gave him influence in the community, and rendered him even popular. After the Boston Massacre, John Hancock gives a very moving speech. It's written in the description below. Please take the time to read it. It's one of the most incredible speeches I've ever, ever had the privilege of reading.